It is my blessing to be here. It's my privilege. I uh, look forward to coming here. I, don't, I know that uh, Janine wanted to be here, but one of the things that happened was she decided to take a forward first fall down eight stairs at the church in Fairbanks where we were ministering there. And because of that, she scraped up the side of her head. I thought when I found her at the bottom of the stairs that she would be, I don't know what. Um, but uh, it was terrible. I, I saw her. I was behind her coming after her through the narrow entrance there to the stairs, and I was closing the door. And uh, as I turned around, she was landing on the third stair down and bouncing to the bottom. And I didn't know what I would find. Uh, I did find her scraped up bad. She was bleeding out of her mouth and and uh, side of her face and nose. and and uh, But she has hurt her neck, we found out last week, and there is a, some muscle damage in the back of her neck, ligament tear. And so she's getting some treatment this week and next week, and we're hoping she can be back on the road uh, in a uh, few weeks. She's hoping that. Uh, we go to Arizona again in May, and so we're going to see grandkids, and she's really hoping she's ready to go for that. And so anytime you can see grandkids when you're on a trip, and we'll be ministering in a church down there that recently lost their pastor uh, to cancer. And so we're going to be helping them. But uh, we're, we're, uh, we're traveling together most all of the time now, which I praise the Lord for. Uh, Janine went with me this year to South Africa in February, and that was a great time, and uh, we had a good time there. And uh, then she's been traveling with me. We've been to Alaska twice this year already for ministry up there, and so then other places in between. So we've been quite busy, but it's great to be here, great to be back, and I hope and pray the Lord will really bless throughout this week. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what God has in all of the week and what He's going to put together and how He's going to make it all work because I'm not God. I have no intentions of making anything happen. All I'm going to do is just simply share the Word of God as clear, carefully and clearly as I can and hopefully provoke some thinking in your hearts and your minds and an examination of your own heart and mind and your walk with the Lord. Um, one of the things that has done that in my life is from Hebrews chapter 12 recently, or Hebrews 11, I mean, chapter 11, and it says, without faith it is impossible to please Him. And I've thought about that verse for a long time. Just that phrase, without faith it is impossible to please Him. And there's something missing in that phrase that we miss in churches today. Uh, we speak about faith. We speak about the need for faith because you can't please God without it. And, but there's something we skip that's implied in the verse that should be there in every Christian that I find is not there. And that's the attitude of I want to please Him. That I actually have a desire to please God. It's implied in the verse, and the reason it's implied is because it's a normal part of a relationship with Christ that you will want to please God. If you don't have a desire in your heart to please God, then I'm questioning what kind of a salvation you have. I'm questioning what kind of a relationship you have if you are saved. Because if I came here and said to you that I have no desire to please my wife, the first thing you would say is, I wonder what kind of a relationship you have with your wife. Well, I knew Janine was not going to be able to go with me on this trip. And so Saturday, actually Friday, I was out running around doing some last-minute errands. And one of the things I did was bought her a bouquet of flowers. I enjoy that. I say, dear, I brought you some work. <laughs> You're going to have to put these in a vase. She says, I don't mind. <laughs> I like pleasing her. I like it when she smiles and wants to give me a kiss and a hug. And what a joy that is. 
And uh, I have a desire for that. I have a desire to see her pleased with what I do and what I say. And first question I get is when she's with me, uh, first question I ask her is, well, what did you think after the message? She's honest brutally sometimes. And, uh, <laughs> but praise the Lord for that. But she's always one of the peoples that I want to know what she thinks. Why? Because we have a relationship and it's ongoing and I'm desirous of her being pleased. If you don't desire to please God, then it makes me question what kind of a relationship do you have with God? What is going on between you and the Lord? And I think that's a valid question, don't you? I think it'd be a very valid question. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. If you don't care whether or not you please God, then you probably, all the preaching on faith isn't going to matter a bit. It's not going to amount to anything. So the question is, do you have that personal, intimate relationship with God that moves you and motivates you to desire to please God? It's, a, it's an assumed thing here in this passage. In Hebrews 11, 6, it's assumed that out of a relationship with God, there comes a desire to please God. If you don't have that, you're missing a basic element of the relationship with God that he intends you to have. You're missing something in your understanding of his salvation. And I think that's what drives me back to the book of Colossians. Because God has done something amazing in Scripture. And as, as I've come to understand it, it's kind of an oversight of the book of Colossians. If you take your Bible and turn there with me, Colossians chapter 1. And one of the things he does is this. He puts it this way. Here's the salvation that I have for you. Here's the reason I have this salvation for you and I can offer it to you is because of who Jesus Christ is, what Jesus Christ has done for us, and now he makes us secure and stable in that relationship with him. After that, he then says, here's what I've brought to you. Now, let me start working on you. So often we don't come to a relationship with God that gives us security and stability. We are wondering whether or not we're saved. We're wondering whether or not I can please God, whether or not I'm accepted of God, or if he's going to reject me in some way. I like what Ephesians says, that there is no condemnation, there is no rejection. We have been made accepted in the Beloved. He does the same thing here in the book of Colossians. Chapter 1 and 2 are all about who we are in Christ, what he has done for us, what he has provided for us in salvation, and how far-reaching that salvation is into our lives. And I praise God for that. Because without security and stability, when God says, okay, now I want to work on you, I'm going to say, well, wait a second, God, I'm not sure about this. When he starts turning and says, okay, now let's change your heart's affection. Let's change you individually. Let's put some things in. Let's take some things out. You can say, now wait a second, God. Uh, this is who I am. This is my security and stability because this is me. And we come across that way even though we might not intentionally do that. And I think it comes from a lack of stability and security in our relationship with the Lord and a lack of understanding of the depth of the salvation He gives us. The ramifications of that salvation. Without understanding that, then we're going to constantly be living a life of guilt. We will constantly be living a life of seeking acceptance of God in some way. And I can guarantee you this, you will never personally feel like you have done enough to be approved of God. Because there is nothing I can do to make myself feel that. Because any amount of sin, be it small or big, will take that away from me every time. Without an understanding of what his salvation is and what it means in our life, we will not have that security and stability of a relationship with him. When I do have that security and stability, then nothing in life is going to challenge it. 
because it's not based on the circumstances of life. It's not based on what's going on around me, the circumstances that I'm in in the country, in the economic states, whatever it is in my life, it's not going to change this relationship between me and he and he and me. And what the great thing about that is, when I understand that security and stability, then I have personally inside of me stable life without even concern about what's going on around me. I can enter into relationships from a secure, stable position. Without that ability, then I'm constantly seeking from the relationships around me for my security. I'm seeking for my acceptance. I'm seeking for my stability from people. And I can guarantee you this, it's always going to fall short of what you need. For there is only one person that can provide security and stability, and that's our God. No matter what the situation is of our life, no matter what the circumstances is of our life. When we understand that I've been made accepted in the beloved, what a privilege it is to know that God accepts me. I like that because um, then I don't care if anybody else does or not. My God does. I like um, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything else. I kind of think it's David bragging. The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about it for a second. He's my shepherd. What else do I need? I shall not want. I suffer no lack in my life. I have him. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Look at what my God does for me. Look what he's provided me. What a privilege it is to know him. I like that. We forget that aspect of the Christian life. And so when somebody comes along and says, you know what, there's things in your life that you need to change, we go, oh, no, 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 don't tell me about that. Uh, we're not secure and stable in our relationship with God. We're looking for security and acceptance from somebody else. I kind of find it interesting that we look to the church or to the pastor or somebody and we actually live our spiritual life vicariously sometimes through them rather than having a personal intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what Colossians 1 and 2 is all about because then he gets to chapter 3 and he says, okay, let's talk about your heart. Here's what I've provided for you. Here's the relationship you have with me. Now here's what I've provided for you is what's here in the first one and two. Then he goes to chapter three and says, okay, now here's how you change. Here's how this should affect you. Here's your heart's affection. Here's what you should take out of your life. Here's what you should put into your life. Wow, that's huge when we understand it the way God puts it together. He does this in Romans. He does this in, in Ephesians. He does it in Galatians. He does it in every book that you see in the New Testament that's talking about the Christian and his walk with his Savior. He challenges, first of all, often with the idea of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done and that great salvation that we have in him. And because of that now, here's how we live. He does the same thing in Hebrews. He does the same thing. And it's just incredible when you start seeing this. But so often in the Christian life, the first thing we see after we're saved is, I've got to stop doing this and I've got to start doing this. Now let's really talk about it for a minute. Let's talk about here's your relationship with God. Here's how you walk with Him. Here's what He's provided in that relationship. Look with me, if you would, at Colossians chapter 1, because it's so great to see in the passage. He uses in chapter 1 of Ephesians the word that we've been made accepted in the beloved. In chapter 1 of Colossians, he puts it this way. Verse 12, he says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And that meet has the idea of, the idea of suited or, or provided everything we need to be a partaker of this inheritance in Christ. Joined heirs with Christ, and we've been given all that's necessary in Christ. We have it all already, and what a privilege that is. He hath made us meet, suited, complete. 
Praise the Lord. He explains it even further in chapter 2, but let's go on in chapter 1. He says in verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, I have the forgiveness of sins. Um, I don't know about you, but I raise my hand. I need that. Don't you? I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And praise God, I have one. Praise God, it's Jesus Christ. And it goes on to tell about my Savior. Verse 15, who is the image of the visible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. And I said in Sunday school, this is the passage I was teaching on, when the person asked me that Jesus Christ is a created being, making that statement. And I said, it's impossible for him to be a created being and yet create all things. How does all change its meaning from all to something else but himself? He's created all things, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body of the church, which is the be who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, verse 18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through, his, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He did it all. And here's the declaration. Here's the presentation of you. He's presenting you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. That has nothing to do with your work. This has everything to do with his work. Praise the Lord. He did it by himself. Now in my position, praise the Lord, this is who I am in Christ. When I accepted Christ as my Savior, this is what God brought to me, a complete salvation. And it's through Jesus Christ. And you know what's so interesting about it is we're trying to bring something back to him. And salvation saying, you know what, God, you know, I have to do something, don't I? No, that's my flesh crying out saying, I want some in, something in this. I want some glory in this. No, we don't have anything to glory in and of ourselves. It is all of Jesus Christ. That's what or 1 Corinthians tells us, that we have nothing to glory in of ourselves. And the whole purpose of the way God put salvation together is for that reason. He put it that, together that way, that no flesh should glory in his presence. There is nothing in us to glory in. But praise God, he did it all. He paid the price completely and fully for our salvation. He did it all, and he now has brought to me a complete salvation that I stand in standing before him, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. That's the salvation I have. Now, let me ask you about your experience. Do you feel that all the time? I don't think so. I don't either. Because I know me better than that. I'm not perfect. And excuse me, uh, you probably know me well enough to know that's true too. My wife definitely does. She'll testify for it. I mean, I'm not perfect. Are you? But here's my standing before God. Here's the salvation that he brought. Here's the privilege of my position in Christ. Here's who I really am. I like that. Because when I understand who I am in Christ, that helps me to, to focus on who I am rather than what I'm failing at all the time. It helps me to focus on, on who he is and be thankful for a complete salvation that he's brought to me rather than 
focusing on how many times I fail to live up to. How many times I, I don't do and be. We lose our ability to be thankful when we start looking at ourselves. I remember talking to a guy when I was in South Africa and he came over to the house where we were staying and we sat out on the porch or veranda there overlooking the area and it's a beautiful place they put us up in. And, and uh, one of the things he said to me, he kept going on about, oh, well, I, I'm having trouble with this and I, I, I'm having trouble believing this and I'm having trouble with this over here. And, and I said to him immediately, I said, well, there's a problem here because you know what you've done? Every statement you've made is I. Your focus is on you rather than on Jesus Christ. Your focus is on your life rather than on what God's doing. Your focus is on what's, what you think, what you want, what you like. I remember a guy down in, in uh, Arizona was preaching a series on, on uh, grace. And one of the nights was uh, talking about humility. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. And he was not saved yet. He'd never accepted Christ as his Savior yet. And he'd been there for several nights. And we were talking after each service concerning the message. And as I was talking with him after the service on humility, very truthfully, we have to be humble to accept God's grace for salvation. If you think you're worthy or you think you have the ability to somehow save yourself, you're going to miss out on the grace of God. Because God doesn't give grace to people who are proud and in themselves in any way. He gives grace to the humble. And so as you're looking at that and talking about it, he, he uh, told me, he says, well, I'm very humble. I said, that's interesting. So as we talked a little further, we talked about his salvation and he said, I don't understand why God had to put it together this way. Why can't this do it this way? And he came up with a couple of suggestions and I said, so you're humble, huh? And you want to tell God how to put salvation together. Don't tell me you're humble. Well, we had a close enough relationship at that time. He just took that. Otherwise, if we weren't friends by that point, I should have ducked. But, uh, but think about it for a minute. Understanding who Christ is and what He's done in our life. Understanding the grace that He has brought to us, the privilege that it is to be saved. Understanding my position. Focusing on Christ, who ought to be the greatest love of our life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your might. I want to simply say that we have lost the ability in many Christian circles to have that intimate personal relationship with Christ for we focus so often on the doing of the Christian life rather than the walking with our God. Listening to God. Having the Holy Spirit convict and convince when was the last time you were under Holy Spirit conviction because of sin in your life and you knew it? When was the last time you had God working in your life, showing you something, direction, things, and you knew it? When was the last time you just had that personal, heartfelt love for your Savior? And you knew it. Had a great camp a few years ago where the young people came to me and said, you know what, I, I need to be doing more for God. I need to be doing more for God. And a great group of senior high kids. I mean, it's just a super group. And as I was talking with the kids, I, they gave me an hour session each day with my, me and the kids just personally to talk about things. And we did. We had a great time. And, and so they kept telling me, you know, I just need to be doing more for God. I need to be doing more for God. And I said, you know, young people, let, let, me, let me share with you something. You're missing something basic in your walk with the Lord. I appreciate, and, and that's oftentimes what people hear. I need to be doing more for God. I need to be doing for God. I need to be doing this. I need to be doing that. I need to be changing. I need to be growing. I need to be, I need to be doing... No. I said, what we need to be doing is walking with our God. He's not interested in so much in what you do. 
I'm amazed in the Old Testament how many times he talks about sacrifices and things that he doesn't have pleasure in. He's more interested in your heart. And out of a right heart and a right relationship and a right walk with God will come a life of doing. Will come a hard attitude of why we do what we do because we want to, not because I have to. I have a relationship with God that's working and ongoing in my life. And that's what he's talking about in the book of Colossians. That's what he's talking about in the New Testament. And when he's talking about our relationship with Christ now, that we are in him. We have this personal relationship. And what a privilege it is to be a Christian. And the young people, I praise God, some of them got it that week. And it was so neat to see because it takes off this bondage of I've got to be doing, I've got to be being. And, and, and the constant guilt because I need to be doing more. I need to be doing more. No, you need to be walking with God. Experiencing the joy-filled relationship that Jesus Christ intended. The peace-filled relationship. I have peace in my heart. The love of God wrapped around your whole life. Everything about you. I love this passage. I love scripture when he teaches us about this relationship. And that's what he's teaching us in this passage. He goes on and he talks about why he's preaching and what is the privilege of this and what a great privilege it is. Because he says in verse 26 in Colossians 1, even the mystery which has been hid from ages, from generations, but now is manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Here's the privilege of a relationship with Christ. Christ in you. Wow. I have a personal relationship with God. A personal, intimate, ongoing relationship with God. If you don't have that, if you're missing something in that, what's going on in your life? What's, what, 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 what's changed? What's, where were you? Did you get saved? Are you truly born again? Have you, do you have that personal relationship? Or what have you allowed to rob you of that security and stability of relationship with him? Our focus can go so many different directions. And we're going to look in chapter 2 at some of the detriments to this relationship. But he talks first of all in chapter 2, and I, <clears throat> but look first at verse 28 of tw chapter 1. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28 says this, whom we preach, warning every man er and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's what we are in Christ. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Verse 1 of chapter 2. For I would know, I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Here's a great passage because it's encouraging to me. Here I am, a missionary evangelist. I travel all over, and I have the privilege of sharing the greatest message of Jesus Christ. But I've had people say, you know what, you don't care about me. How can you care about me? You don't know me. Why would you care? Paul's saying right here in the same passage why I care. He's saying this. I have a desire for the people that I haven't even seen before. I have a desire that they might know Jesus Christ. And that they might know what it is to have that personal, intimate relationship with Him and experience the love, the joy, and the peace that comes from our God. You may be right. I don't know you. I don't know your circumstances. I don't know what's going on in your life. I was sharing with the church in Alaska I said, you know what? We don't have to be controlled by our past. We don't have to be controlled by what went on in our past. There's so many people out there living victim-based lives. Now, I was a victim of this. I had this happen. I had that happen. And I said, you know what? We don't have to let that take over our future. Look who you are in Christ and what God has made you. 
Look at what He's doing in your life now. And look how He's building you. And we don't have to let those things control us. And I remember talking, I talked to several families afterwards, having personal time together with them. And then I talked with the men's group on a, on a, a Saturday night. We had a, a group of men get together for, for um, some Bible time and just some pizza and stuff. And anyway, as we were talking, some of the guys brought the same thing up. <clears throat> Well, we should learn from our past. Yeah, we should. I don't want to repeat the same mistakes again. But I don't have to be controlled by my past. Why? I had somebody say, yeah, but you don't know what happened to me. But you don't know this. You don't know this about me. But, but, but what about this? What about that? And I said, you know what? It really doesn't matter. Because for you and I as Christians... And, 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 and I don't know your past. I don't know what you've gone through. But I do know my God. I do know the salvation that He brings. I do know the freedom that He gives us to experience a personal, intimate relationship with Him. And to know joy and to know love and to know peace that comes from Him. I know that He can give no matter what has been. And the salvation that He brings to us, He gives us a complete new creation. In Christ, I'm a new creature. In Christ, I am not controlled by the things in this life. I do not have to act ungodly, even though I've been acted on ungodly. I can act godly because God's given me that ability. I don't have to let those things. I can give forgiveness. I can give grace. I can give, you know, I don't have to say that it was okay because many times it's gross, terrible sin that has occurred in our lives and they hurt us all and sin never has stopped doing that. And it never will stop doing that. But I don't have to live under the control of that anymore. In Christ, I have freedom to walk with my God and to experience life and life more abundant. In Christ, I can go on and have victory. I am more than an overcomer. I am more than conquerors through him that loved me, as it says in Romans chapter 8. And I love the emphasis there. It's not on saved me. It's not on the person who gave me mercy. It's about love. The love-based relationship between you and Christ. The love-based relationship of God working in you, changing you, molding you, building you, and giving you life and life eternal. What a privilege it is to be a Christian. And that love-based relationship with Him. And so many times, and this is where it gets uh, it's complicated, is, is we get looking at our past, we look at those things that have happened, and I'm justified holding these feelings, and I'm justified doing this, and this is the why I am why I am, and you're just going to have to accept me. And I say, my God's bigger than that. And that's what Paul's saying here. I have the privilege of sharing a God who changes lives. Who can build lives. I praise God for that. Boy, I praise God for that. Paul, the compassion of verse 1. I have a great conflict. That's, a, that's great compassion. People say, why do you preach with such passion and why do you preach with such conviction? Because I believe this with all my heart because I know it's true. God said so. And I've seen it change lives. But I have seen the hurt and the destruction of sin and the terrible things that have happened to people. And I feel with every ounce of my being for them. I hate it. I look forward to a world that's not controlled by sin anymore. Where sin's not around. I look forward to a new heavens and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And what a day that's going to be. But that's all because of my Savior. Praise God. It's out of Him. And then he says in verse 1, that great conflict, even for people he doesn't even know yet. Verse 2 that their hearts might be comforted. Oh, I like that word. Because that's what I need. 
we were talking in a discussion, and I like getting in good discussions. We had a group of men and about six of us talking, and we were having a discussion on the subject of why did Christ come and what was it that he really offered. And I think one of the greatest things that I like out of that is, is hope. He offered hope. Hope for a better day. Now in Christ, it's a hope of surety. I know it's coming. There is a new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And I know that's going to be here. And I hope for that. Look forward to that. But he's also offering hope for the life of the believer here on this earth. I hope better days are coming. In our economics, I don't think so. In the political structure of our world today, I don't know. I can't find that hope in what's going on around me. I'm finding more and more sin. I'm finding it more common and more prevalent. I find the inroads of all these terrible things into people's lives and the destruction of sin. Because sin destroys relationships. It hurts people. But I still find in Christ hope. Because I don't have to be controlled by that sin. And I don't have to be controlled by the circumstances of this world. I don't have to be caught up with the appetites and attitudes of this world. I can be caught up in my Savior. And what a privilege it is to share a God who comforts, a God who gives hope. When I'm doing counseling with people, the first thing I want them to hopefully see is hope. Because that's my hope for them, is that they see that there's hope for them. In Christ there is. Your hope cannot be because of me or somebody else around you. Your hope must be in a God who loves you and cares about you. And you can be comforted by that fact. And here's, here's, here's Paul expressing his heart's desire for them. That they might be comforted. What a great thing. And their comfort comes from what? Being knit together in love. The bond of perfectness, as it says in chapter 3. Unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding and to acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. What the mystery is, is in chapter 1, we already looked at it, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And to the acknowledgement of it, full assurance of understanding. Can I say that? How, this is a position of complete security and stability in Christ. I am sure, I am solid, nobody's going to move me. I have a relationship with God. I'm accepted in the beloved and nothing can shake it. No matter what happens in this world, people will say to me, you know, I'm really concerned about the economic situation of our country. People will say to me, I'm concerned about the political situation in our country. Quite frankly, my life is not dependent on who's in the White House. My life is dependent on Jesus Christ. Now, who's in the White House, who's in Congress may affect my life. But my life is dependent on Jesus Christ. I go to another country. So I go to countries that have dictatorships. What do I tell them? You can't have a Christian life because you have a dictatorship. Oh, I don't tell them that. Your life is dependent on Jesus Christ. But about the economic state? There are people that have lost jobs and have been out of work for months, some years. My life's dependent on Jesus Christ who will meet my needs. He'll take care of me. I don't know how. I don't know what. People ask me about ministry. Uh, do, you, do you enjoy doing what you're doing? Yes, I love doing what I'm doing because I get to share with people a God that loves them and can change their lives. But if God ch changed that tomorrow, am I doing this because this is all I can do? No. I'm doing this because this is what God wants me to do. And if God wants something else tomorrow, I'm glad to go do that. Because my life is not ministry. My life is not my work. My life is Jesus Christ. And the assurance and solidity of that, the security and stability of that, that's what he's teaching us in the relationship with Christ. 
And he does it even more in chapter 2, and we're going to go into that tonight. This morning, I hope we've whet your appetite. I hope we've whet your appetite for a personal, intimate relationship with Christ. A study this week that is going to challenge us in that walk with our Savior. In that relationship with Christ. A challenge this week that is going to challenge us in the, in the areas of understanding what he says here. In full assurance of understanding and the acknowledgement of Christ in you, the hope of glory. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to have that personal, intimate relationship with Christ? How does that affect your life, change your life, make you who you are? This is powerful. This is powerful. We so often miss it. We get caught up in the doing of Christ, doing of Christianity, rather than the walking with our Savior and the fellowship with Him. We miss out on the joy and the privilege it is to be a Christian. We don't come with hearts of thanksgiving to God for what he's brought to us. We come with hearts of, oh Lord, do I have to do this and this and this because I'm supposed to as a Christian? That's not the Christian life that God gives us. You're missing something in your walk and your understanding of what it is to be a Christian. And that's what we're going to talk about this week. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I share with you an offer of a full and complete salvation through Him and Him alone? That's all you need. Jesus Christ, He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day, completing the payment. It's finished. There is no more salvation anywhere else. Anything else to be done, it is finished in Him. And that you can have Christ in you, the hope of glory. He saves you. He makes you a new creature. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, we'd love to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. But if you do know Christ as your Savior, how's your intimacy with Christ? How's your walk? How's your relationship with the Savior? Good questions for us to ask this morning. And we're just getting started. I hope and pray you'll be able to be here. I'm looking forward to the time. It's a great study. Um, I get so excited about it because we have a great God and a great salvation and a great privilege is ours. And it's not hard to be a Christian. He did it all to make me one. And it's not hard to walk with my Savior because He's provided everything I need to do it. Praise the Lord. To Him be the glory. To Him be the praise. He did it all.